Um, my name's Peter. Grew up in Los Angeles. Found out I grew up just like a couple blocks away from this guy over there. So I'm in the town of Agora. He's in Oak Park, if you know anything about this. Crazy small world. But um, my background's mostly originally in Ruby. I spent a lot of time in the Rails community. Um, for work, we tried to get off of Rails. And like everybody at the time, we moved to Scala. And Scala sucks. So yeah, I'll stand by that statement. Um, and so after some time, I found the... Uh, I was pivoted into Erlang by a mentor of mine. Um, and if you know anything about Erlang, it's not the prettiest language. And this is about the time when Elixir came on the scene. And so it seemed to be a nice fit. I got involved in that community. And something that really stuck out to me was the idea of flow-based programming, defining your application as a sequence of uh, feeds of data and how they flow and, and connect, and uh, you know, reactive programming, all sorts of interesting things happening along those lines. And eventually, that led me to rethink DB. And so um, I'm hoping that this talk is going to be, my goal in this talk is you to walk away from this talk and thinking, man, I'm using JavaScript or Ruby with rethink DB. What am I doing? I should use Elixir, because it does some amazing things that are really going to change the way you can build and maintain, especially with a group of grad students, applications on top of rethink DB. Um, but what is Elixir? So it said, you know, this is from the elixirlang.org site. It's dynamic, functional, scalable, low latency, distributed, fault tolerant, and it's used in web development and other things. Um, it's built on top of the same VM as Erlang. Erlang was started by Ericsson. Um, they use it in their telephone switches. Um, they report that they reached nine nines of reliability, which meant that I think it was 0.6 seconds of downtime over a course of 20 years or something like that. You know, this is a system designed to be stable, designed uh, largely it accomplishes this, not so much by the application never crashing, but by the service that you provide always being available. And so having proper redundancy fault, you know, and your ability to recover using supervision and various things. So Elixir has fault tolerance, um, has First-class macros, if you ever use Lisp or any language with first-class macros, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, please go take a look at what macros are in a language like Lisp. Um, it's pretty mind-boggling the things you're able to do with them. And I can, I'll show a little bit later what I'm using them for. And then concurrency in Elixir. Um, if you ever heard of the actor model, if you ever use the terrible thing that we call Scala, I already mentioned my feelings on that topic. Um, you'll see there's Project ACA, which has kind of brought uh, actors to you know, be a little more mainstream. Um, but it's the idea of, of uh, dealing with mutable, with mutable state by encapsulating it in, a, in an actor. And so rather than multiple processes or threads or whatever unit of concurrency all trying to read and write the same data, you have a single uh, unit of execution that is in charge of that data and everyone else communicates with it. And so I'll show a bit more about that. And so it seemed like a good match with the fault tolerance of Elixir and the automatic failover that RethinkDB provides, macros and the native language query kind of philosophy and RethinkDB seemed like a fantastic fit. And then the fact that we have these persistent feeds that are, you know, we looked and just saw an example of, you know, thousands of, you know, tens of thousands of these persistent feeds running in an application. You know, being able to deal with high levels of concurrency is very useful in that regard as well. So in the end, you get real-time applications. So concurrency in Elixir. Um, rather than having OS threads, you have these lightweight processes. They are extremely lightweight. Um, just earlier today, just to kind of pull this number out on my laptop here, I spawned 100,000 of these uh, Elixir processes, and it took just over 200 megs of RAM. Um, Recently, they did a, you know, Phoenix is one of the big web frameworks on Elixir. They recently did a benchmark and did 2 million simultaneous web so socket connections to a single server. And when they broadcasted to all 2 million of them, it took about a second to deliver all, all two, 2 million messages and the acts that they were received. Um, it's built on top of, of Beam, which is the Erlang VM. Um, it has a, an a very latency sensitive scheduler. And so if you're familiar with you know, concurrency in JavaScript, when you know that you should never do a Fibonacci or anything, or, or a factorial, or anything that's computationally intensive because it prevents other things from running, not the case on top of Erlang. There, it's able to uh, timeshare between multiple processes on you know, however many CPUs you have. And so 
designed in an age, you know, very much around distributed systems, and it's designed to run on as much hardware as you have available. Um, because of that, you don't need to deal with asynchronous callbacks and things like that. You can write blocking code. You can, you know, I want to make a request, and my code is going to sit here until that request is done, and it won't have an effect on any other code that's executing. And then the actor model makes it really easy to have safe data protection and access. Um, macros. Um, I don't have a whole lot of macros here because they're a fairly complex topic, but basically the Elixir language can be represented as a uh, series or as an, an abstract syntax tree, and with macros you're able to mani manipulate that tree itself. And so you can take a block of code and go through and literally replace all pluses with minuses if you wanted to, and then output that, and then the compiler will actually compile that as code. Um, very, very powerful, and most of the Elixir language is built on top of itself. And so, you know, if you see, a good example is, you know, the, the uh, construct uh, unless, you know. So unless this do something. You know, that translates just to an if else. But this happens at compile time, and so you have these, you know, this rich syntax that doesn't actually take, uh, have a runtime overhead. Um, and then here, fault tolerance, nine nines, that's a lot of nines of uptime. And then the notion of supervision trees, um, basically every process is supervised by another process, so if it crashes, it will be restarted properly, and there's a whole bunch of interesting rules around that, and I'll get into that a little bit more on how I'm using that. So rethink query language, reQL. Um, one thing that's very interesting here is, since it's a functional language, we don't have your classic object-oriented structure. So we don't have method chaining like you, like you would see in uh, some of the other drivers. And so this top example here, um, it's kind of hard to read. You know, we have our database test, and we grab the table people on that database, and then we filter based on this map of you know foo, key foo value bar. Um, uh, Elixir has added a wonderful operator called the pipe operator, and it's this pipe with an uh, angle bracket. It originally comes from F sharp, um, but it essentially means take this value and use it as the first argument in the next function that's being called. And so the second example is much easier here. DB test, table people, filter this. Um, so that works out very, very nicely, easy to read. Um, we have, you know, since RethinkDB is very dependent upon anonymous functions, and you can filter on them, you can map on them, all these things, um, the easy way to do this is you use all of these specific RethinkDB functions. So here we have a a filter, it takes a person, it calls bracket on that person, which is the rethink DB call to get a, uh, a value associated with the key. And then it uh, tests whether or not it's greater than another person who we added five to their bracketed age. With macros, at compile time, we can take a function like this, which is very easy to read, this, this bottom one here, count person friends if it's you know, greater than five plus the person's age. I think this is a very important query. I'm sure there's a use case somewhere where we care about the number of friends being related to their age somehow. That might be another number theory topic for professors in Washington. But um, using this Lambda macro, we're able to take that function that's passed in and completely rewrite it in, at compile time into the re uh, rethink query language structure that it expects, um, which gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, and you know, a couple of the other drivers, you look at JavaScript, for example, Rather than being able to square bracket into a value, you have to actually call it as a function and various quirks that show up in other languages. For the most part, we can use macros to get around them here. Um, but change feeds are the interesting thing. And so the first pass I took at change feeds was that they're enumerable. Just treat them like a cursor. And you can map over them. You can filter them. In Elixir, we have uh, two different libraries. We have a stream library in an enum library, and they signify how we're going to iterate over something. So the stream library is lazy in that it will not actually execute until we eagerly map over something. And so the top example here, if you were to filter the, you know, a change feed, you're never going to finish filtering because it's always waiting for the next element to come. But if in the second example, if you use stream filter, it's going to apply that filter whenever we actually do iterate over it. And so the second example is semantically what you would want here. You'd want to filter based on some function called foo. Um, sorry, some of the syntax is going to be foreign to most people here. I don't, I don't want to dive too much into every little bit of syntax, but 
Uh, we're going to filter based on some function called foo, and then as we receive each element, we'll apply that filter. If it passes that filter, we'll then inspect it. Um, this is really convenient, you know, writing some quick scripts and, and doing some things, but this isn't really the classic Erlang OTP way to build things. It's not easy to supervise. If it crashes, it's not easy to restart, and so there's a lot of things you're missing out there. And so one of the things I added, and uh, I really love the fact that the guides to you know, writing a driver in your language encouraged adapting it to be as idiomatic in the language as possible. And so what we have here in Elixir, you have these processes that you spin up, and we often define a blueprint for the process. Um, and so here, I, we have this use rethink DB change feed, um, which basically says this is going to be a change feed, and there's two functions that should be implemented in this module. One of them is, is uh, init, and the other one is handle update. And so in init, you build the query, and you find the connection, and that returns subscribe query connection. And then in handle update, you will receive updates from the database as they come. You have a state that you can you know, store, and every time you process it, you ask for the next, and you return that new state. And so if this can be using a lot of patterns. Um, one good example here is um, you get the new data, you send that data to a WebSocket, and then you store you know, whatever the WebSocket responded or various things like that. Um, this is a little bit foreign, I, I do understand, but this is very idiomatic for Erlang and Elixir. And it enables us to do some really interesting things. So down here at the bottom is how we supervise this. So we're creating a worker, a person change feed here. We're providing the database and then the ID. And then this is set up so that if that change feed ever crashes, we lose a connection to the database, anything of that sort, the supervision tree is actually going to cause that to restart. And the way I've written it, it will do an exponential back off until it can find the database again and reestablish that change feed. And at that point, it'll start pushing it out to the WebSockets again. Um, and so I have a little demo here. Um, if anyone's got the laptop open, go to friends.peterhamilton.info. This is a really stupid demo, but it makes for some interesting things. It's also a life lesson. So there's a leaderboard here, and you can see that you can follow people. And there's, you know, when people follow you, messages show up here saying someone started following you. So each of these four quadrants are all separate change feeds. Um, the life lesson here is that leaderboard is the number of people you are friends with. And so if you're friends with a lot of people, if you're nice to people, you'll win in life. Um, yeah, this is not a popularity contest. It's really easy to win, just be friends with everybody. Um, and so we can play with that a little bit. Um, these names are all randomly generated. Um, hopefully nothing inappropriate is generated. Last time I gave this talk, a few inappropriate names showed up, so we should be good here. Um, so, so there's four different things going on here. And so this is the supervision tree I've been talking about. And so this is just a part of it. This is one of the branches. But every single uh, WebSocket connection is its own process. So these are the WebSocket connections here. This is from running on my local machine. But I could, you know, this is a live instance that was running at one point in time. Um, I could probably get the production, the one that everyone's looking at right now, and see live what's going on. But it gets pretty big quickly. So each of these processes is a, web, is a WebSocket. And then here's our uh, database supervision tree. So here's our database connection right here. And then as its sibling, we have another supervisor. This supervisor um, supervises a leaderboard change feed. So that's a global feed that's keeping uh, the state of that leaderboard that we saw here. So you know all the people and what they're following. Um, that process, every time a new user joins, they query this process and say, what is the latest state? And so we can actually keep them from hitting the database. They use the one that we have locally here. Um, if this were to crash, it would reload from the database. Um, and uh, it would actually broadcast out the latest version to all the WebSockets that are connected, and they would update with the latest. Um, we have the people change feed. So these are all the people that have now joined. And so over here, people you are not currently following. This is just a list of people that exist. Um, that is another global change feed that broadcasts out to all the WebSockets available. And then here we have these uh, two other change feed supervisors. And so each of these, whenever a WebSocket connects, they create their own personal feed. Um, and that feed then goes on uh, to push them updates whenever 
the people that are following them changes or whenever new messages are, are, are available. And these are linked to the WebSocket, so when the WebSocket crashes, it'll crash. But if it crashes, it'll restart, and if the WebSocket's still there, it'll keep pushing changes to it. So it ends up being a very clean, easy way to structure the relationship between your change feeds and your users and other parts of your application. Um, I've, I'm, you know, wasn't planning this part of the demo, so I'm not, but uh, when, I g when I gave this talk last time to the Elixir meetup, I actually went in and killed the database and showed how this recovered and, and whatnot. Um, it works remarkably well. Um, but yeah, and so one thing that's really interesting here is the notion of self-healing um, within your supervision tree. So the database is at the very top of the tree here. If the database crashes, all the change feeds are killed and restarted um, because the connection that they had is no longer valid since change feeds are you know, are tied to this particular connection. If a particular change feed keeps crashing too frequently, that bubbles up and its supervisor will then crash. And if that crashes too frequently, its supervisor will crash. And eventually its supervisor will crash. And when a supervisor crashes, all the children crash. And so if a certain change feed is in a state, is just in a weird state, there's something that it cannot recover from, that's probably symptomatic of, some, of our database connection being in a weird state. And eventually, it'll bubble up and just crash everything, get back to a known state, start it all up, and you're up and running again. And you might not even have gotten paged in the time that took. Um, and so this, this is what Elixir and the Erlang VM give you. I think there's a lot of value there. Um, I mostly just explain this. Um, but you know, for posterity people who are reading the slides, it's important to see how all that comes into play. So that's what I have here. Um, this is something I've been working on for about six months now. Um, since uh, I do not do this as part of my day job, this is something I've just taken on as a hobby. I'm you know, very interested in this, using it for a few personal projects. But it's remarkable how much work it is to fully test the entire gamut of functionality that is in a driver like this. And so if anyone is interested, I would love you to chime in, hop on GitHub, open up an issue, you know, open an issue, say, how can I help even? Like, that's great. But these are the three main things I've identified where help would be useful here is comb through it all, pick query functions, figure out how they match up with the ones in the official drivers, report differences, build something with it, um, and let me know. We're, we actually have a little wiki page uh, on GitHub with all the things people have built, just little tinkering sample applications. And then I'd actually, and this one's kind of fun, I want to do this myself, but someone else can have the fun, is really just performance test this. One of the interesting things we're doing here is we're using the multiplexing uh, uh, capabilities of the Rethink protocol. And so over a single database connection, you, we actually, like, um, we interleave all the different queries coming from all the clients. And I did some you know, early testing on my own of this and tried a connection pool versus single client and didn't notice any real performance difference which is fantastic. Um, and that's something I don't think most of the official drivers do. Last time I looked, they don't do a whole lot of interspersing there. Um, and so there's a lot of things that are, you know, that would be interesting there. Um, but yeah, th that's all I got tonight. Um, you know, here's my shameless plug. Give me a call if you're doing anything interesting. I'm always on the lookout for, you know, interesting things to do. And uh, I'd like to just uh, open up to any questions.